following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The Arcanum 13 of the Sacred Book of the Tarot depicts a man wielding a scythe. He dips his scythe into the waters. in order to harvest the wheat the image of the arcanum 13 is an image of a reaper one who is reaping the seed or culling the grain from the earth. The card or this sacred law of the number 13 is called immortality. The word immortality has as its core this Latin term, mort, which of course begins with the letter M. And mort, of course, refers to death. Interestingly, the 13th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the letter M, or in other words, mem. The letter M is also found in the Sanskrit word for death, which is mrityu, spelled M-R-T-Y-U in uh, Roman letters. But in the simplest form, the term death in Sanskrit can be simply said, ma. Or in other words, the letter M in Sanskrit. And as everyone knows, ma refers to the mother. And ma is the beautiful phrase that the child speaks. Often, the very first thing that a child will say is ma, crying for ma, for mother. And this term ma, of course, is related to mater in Latin, which also means mother, but also means matter, the root of these terms. So we find death and the mother very closely linked. But also the water. 
the mare, the waters, related to the M. In Hebrew, the word for death is met, which is spelled, of course, with a mem. So the Arcanum 13 is related with death. And it encodes and contains the, the synthesis, the science of how to conquer death, or in other words, to acquire immortality, which is the name of this arcana, this arcanum. But death has its science. In order to comprehend what immortality means, what mortality is, you have to understand what death is. In order to understand life, you have to understand death. Because life and death are two sides of the same phenomenon. It's impossible to have life without death. Life and death are two parts of the same thing. Unfortunately, in most of the cultures in this day and age, death is avoided. The very subject of death is avoided. The very idea, the very topic is avoided in our personal lives, in our families, in our relationships. We can't bear the thought of death, much less the discussion. And oddly, and with a great contradiction, we are obsessed with death in our media, in films, in books, in television. Obsessed. What is it that lies at the root of this strange contradiction? Obviously, this phenomena of the avoidance of death in practical terms and the obsession with death as a concept lies within our own mind. Something about our own mind is producing this aspect of our culture and this aspect of our lives. What lies within the fear of death? What promotes the fear of death in us? Ignorance. We ignore this term ignore has in its center G N O Gnosis Knowledge. But with the I at the beginning, it becomes a lack of or the avoidance of knowledge. We could say that gnosis itself, the science that we study, is in fact the science of life and death. To have gnosis, to have knowledge, to have that incarnated in oneself, to have gnosis be the very basis of one's action in spontaneity, is to have mastery over life and death. Not conceptual mastery, but mastery in action. This is the opposite of ignorance. So to have that sort of mastery, that kind of understanding, requires that we abandon ignorance. So to understand death, to know about life and death, We have to look at it. We have to study it. We need to understand this arcanum number 13. Death has two primary aspects which concern the student of Gnosis. The first is its immediate practical aspect, which is obviously the death that each one of us is marching towards in this moment. 
Every breath that we draw is a breath we take in our march towards death. No one person that exists can avoid that. And yet, we avoid it in the mind. We avoid it in the heart. We choose to ignore the inevitability of our own death. And this is a great problem for us. When we ignore something, we cannot deal with it. If you have a sickness or an illness and you ignore it, it becomes worse. And the same is true of the knowledge of death. Some say that the science of gnosis is the science of preparing for death. The science of the preparation on a daily basis for death itself. This is true. And when we go deeper into that, what that really means, it means that we have to cultivate a sense of the life and death of all things, which in other terms is called impermanence. Because we ignore the fundamental truth of impermanence, we develop attachment. And attachment is the cause of suffering. We have a relationship, for example, with someone that we love. Because we ignore the inevitability of the loss of that love, the loss of that relationship, we become attached. And we suffer. When we grasp so tightly to anything, whether it's material or emotional or mental, we develop suffering because we're ignoring the fundamental truth of all compounded elements. They will dissolve. All things in the manifested universe are subject to this law of impermanence. They arise they pass away. When we grasp anything with attachment, we initiate the process of suffering in ourselves. And the more tightly we grasp it, the more intense our suffering will be. This is why in all the great Asian traditions, there is a lot of discussion about detachment. And it's also present in the Bible. To always remain aware that all manifested things will pass away. All earthly things. And earthly in the sense we mean manifested. To cultivate this conscious comprehension of impermanence gives us the capacity to treat those things which are precious with their true value. When we have attachment for something, when we're grasping it, we're enforcing our own selfish will. This is a cause of suffering. In the case of a relationship, when we're grasping onto another person, be they a spouse or a child, we're enforcing our will over that person to pull them to us, to hold on to them, to grasp them. This is a prison. It's a cage. We think it's love, but it isn't. It's selfishness. To love in truth is to love for it as it is. To have respect for that object of our affection as it is. To allow it its own process to allow it its own life. Take, for example, your own physical body. Because we ignore the fundamental truth that our own physical body will pass away, we become very attached to it. Now, that attachment may be craving in the form of loving this body. It may also be aversion 
in the form of hating it, but it is attachment. And that attachment to the body causes us to become very afraid, to be fearful, to be vain, to be proud, to be ashamed. That attachment stimulates these qualities in our life. And the more we grasp out of fear, out of pride, onto this body, the more we suffer, particularly when the idea of death approaches or when the practical truth of death approaches, our suffering becomes more intense. This is all rooted in ignorance. It's very liberating to realize the inevitability of death and to realize in one's own consciousness, in meditation, that you've already died many times. The essence, the consciousness that you have inside is what is, in truth, immutable in the sense that it continues. It continues. We have experienced death many, many times. We have inhabited bodies and abandoned them and inhabited new bodies and abandoned them. This is why in the ancient... Uh, Hebrew tradition, one of the scriptures says, the grave takes life and gives it forth again. This concept of the unchanging permanent nature of consciousness is universal. The exception to this are some of the modern religions who ignore the truth of death and teach that once we die physically, that's it. But there's no evidence of that anywhere in nature. In fact, Einstein himself proved with his theory of relativity that reincarnation or re-embodiment is a fact. Because he stated, you cannot destroy energy. You cannot. Energy simply changes shape. Energy becomes matter, becomes energy again but you cannot destroy it. The consciousness itself, the essence we have, is energy. It's a form of energy. It's something that persists. If the vessel that we have, the body, is destroyed, the energy moves on. What's important for us to grasp, though, is that it moves on according to laws. But how can we comprehend the nature of those laws and how this can be perceived in our own lives? In the Greek traditions, there are two twin brothers, sleep and death. These two twins have a very intimate psychological meaning for us. What's hidden in that myth is that sleep of the physical body and death are very closely related. When we lie down to allow the physical body to sleep, we abandon the physical body and we dream. The consciousness that we have persists. It perceives, but not physically not inside the physical vessel, but in a more subtle level of nature. This is what we call sleep, the sleep of the physical body. When the physical body is rested or disturbed, the consciousness is pulled back to that physical body. That transition of entering and exiting the physical body is a kind of doorway, a kind of gate and generally, we don't remember passing through that door because our consciousness is weak. We can't even remember what happened a couple of hours ago or a couple of days ago. This shows the weakness of our consciousness. To pass through that doorway between physical sleep and physical wakefulness 
is a kind of shock. And the consciousness that we have now is not strong enough to maintain continuity of awareness through that door. What allows us to pass in and out of that doorway is what's called the silver cord. This cord is mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament. This cord is a kind of link which connects the physical body with the consciousness itself. So there's no danger of us getting lost outside of our physical body, so long as the cord is intact. The only one who can cut that cord is God. Or in other words, the vehicle of God, which is the reaper. The reaper, who is, of course, the angel of death. The angels of death are angels, perfected beings, who are vehicles who express God's law, who act only in accordance with the law. And they, with their scythe, cut that cord at the precise moment that death is determined to occur. And when that occurs, when that death happens, the, the essence, which is out of the body, no longer is connected to that body. That is what we call death. From the point of view of the consciousness, the experience is the same as going to sleep and dreaming. The essence abandons the physical body and passes into the world of Noga, the astral world, the world of dreams. This world, we experience every time we sleep physically. Do you want to know what happens when you die? Look what happens when you go to sleep. It's the same. If you remember nothing of your dreams, you will not be aware when the moment of death comes. Your consciousness will not be strong enough to maintain continuity of awareness through the process of death and the processes that occur after death. But the consciousness persists. It continues its existence, but in a weakened state, weak as it is in us now. Gnosis is preparation for that. Gnosis is the science that we need under any name, it's the science that we need to teach our own consciousness to be awake, to be aware, to become strong, and to be capable of maintaining continual consciousness, continual awareness through whatever happens. We begin that today. We begin by in the very moment being very conscious of ourselves, very aware of ourselves, not dreaming, not fantasizing, not projecting our desires, not avoiding the truths of our life, but perceiving everything as it is. That way, when we lie down to let the physical body rest, we continue our awareness exercising working to maintain continuity of concentration, of attention. Thereby, when the physical body falls asleep, the consciousness can remain actively aware. And we can pass into the dream world, the astral world, consciously with awareness. And this, of course, is what's called dream yoga. Yoga means to yoke to control the dream in ourselves. But that dream yoga is not just something to do at night. We're dreaming all day long. Dream yoga is a practice that occurs in every moment of life. By doing so, by enacting and enabling our own conscious awareness, we're accomplishing a number of things. 
We're developing the capacity to remain present and watchful, which all the scriptures repeat and repeat and repeat. Be watchful. Be aware. There's an important reason behind this. These kernels of wheat the reaper is cutting have many levels of symbolism. But one of the levels is that they represent packets of energy. Of course, as a physical body, we consume wheat to feed ourselves, to to sustain the existence of our body. But such sustenance also exists energetically for our soul. And there are a number of levels here that this can apply. Firstly, what Gurdjieff called Boban Kaldanots, which are packets or, or values of energy which we receive due to our karma. These are values, or in other words, a certain quantity of fuel that we receive when we take a new body. And that quantity of fuel is determined based upon our past actions. We have, of course, three brains. We have an intellectual brain, which is related to the process of thinking, process of thought. We have an emotional brain, which is related to the processes of feeling, to the emotions that we feel. And we have a motor instinctive sexual brain, which is related to our motor activities, such as walking, running, anything we do with the body. It includes instinct, and it includes sexual forces. In each of these three brains is deposited a determined amount, a determined value, a certain quantity of energy or forces Is this value, this number, that gives us our lifespan? Certain spiritual theories state that when a person is born, their death is predetermined to a certain hour and day. This is not exact. Because your own actions have an influence in your destiny. If you are very self-destructive, you will wear yourself out and die before your time. Or get yourself in a bad situation and die due to some horrible, horrible, let's say, accident. The truth is, our own will has an influence on the quality of our life and the length of our life. But I mean action psychologically from moment to moment. As we are now, asleep, daydreaming, tossed about between our memories of the past and our cravings for the future, or our worries for the future, we're in fantasy land. We're not aware of ourselves. We're being buffeted by waves of our own lusts and angers, envy and fear. And with all those waves of emotions and circumstances that hit us, we react automatically without awareness. Someone criticizes us, we respond with anger. Someone blames us, we respond with shame. Automatically, without awareness. All of these reactions, all of these mechanical motions that we go through in life, waste these vital values. When we become identified with any given idea in the mind, any given feeling in the heart, any given activity in the motor instinctive sexual brain, when we become identified, that is, mechanically reacting or acting in accordance with a certain desire, we're wasting energy. We're wasting our own vital values. For example, 
you may grow up a very well-balanced, happy person. But you run into some friends that you want to be liked by. You want them to like you. You want them to admire you. And they drink. And in order to be accepted, you should be a part of the group. You should drink too and smoke and talk with bad language and gossip. Maybe do a little drugs. Maybe listen to some popular music. As you accomplish those activities, desire takes hold. First, you have, of course, the desire to be liked, the desire to be included, the desire to be, ad to be admired, and the fear of rejection. These are all desires. But as the alcohol, the cigarettes, the drugs, and the attention of others infiltrates your senses, you become addicted. The addiction is not merely to the chemical elements of the alcohol or the chemical elements of the cigarette. The addiction is to getting attention. The addiction is to the sensation of doing something rebellious, which is emotional. The addiction is to the fear you see in others when they see you. Oh, what a bad person. Look at all the things he's doing. And we like that. That addiction is emotional, it's mental, it's physical. And those addictions become mechanical behaviors through which we waste these vital values. We waste them. This is why the alcoholics, the drug addicts, and those people who become addicted to these kinds of behaviors die young, become sick, become ill, become mentally and emotionally imbalanced. The boxer, the athlete who becomes addicted, totally identified with success in their physical activity, exhausts the vital values of the body, becomes crippled, becomes physically ill. The actor, the drama queen, who becomes addicted to intense emotional sensations, exhaust the values of their heart and develops heart problems. The intellectual, the skeptic, becomes addicted to the processes of ideas and opinions and becomes schizophrenic, manic. They lose their stability in the mind. Observe humanity and observe the prevalence of mental illness and emotional sicknesses. They vastly outnumber the physical ones. Yet, we avoid them. We avoid knowing how prevalent, how strong, how pervasive mental and emotional illness really is in our culture. We can't deal with it. It's too big of a problem. And, of course, our advertising, our movies, our media are all taking advantage of it. Telling us, you can have happy life, happiness, contentment, if you buy something. If you look a certain way, if you dress a certain way, if you belong to a certain group. This is all utilizing desire to hypnotize us, to manipulate us for the purposes of money, power. For the Gnostic, for the aspirant, awareness becomes the critical step. To be aware, to be observant of one's own three brains. To always be aware of what one is thinking, to always observe what one is feeling, to always be watchful of sensation, of the impulse to act in one way or another. 
How many of us have chosen a career out of envy? How many of us have chosen a career out of fear? Out of pride? How many of our daily activities are driven entirely by the desire to be admired, to be envied? This is only going to produce suffering. To be aware of those things means we have to stop ignoring ourselves to observe, to look, to pay attention. In doing so, we begin to save energy. When we recognize that this particular form of action is driven by envy. Why should I do that? It would be much more intelligent for me to not do that. And when we take that step, we save that energy that we would have otherwise wasted. In that manner, little by little, we begin to save these values, to accumulate them. This is the basis of Gnostic psychology. In that process is death. We become the reaper. Our own consciousness becomes that angel of death from moment to moment in ourselves because we, with the staff of our spinal column harnessing our own energies, with that scythe, the blade, of discriminating awareness. We slice through the wheat of the moment-to-moment -moment experience of any given impression. And we pull out from those impressions the seed, comprehension, understanding, wisdom. And we discard the chaff, that which is not useful, that which we don't need. That is a process of death, dying in our own desires. As Jesus said, we must deny ourselves. Self-denial, in this sense, is psychological. To deny one's own desires in the mind. To do that requires gnosis. In other words, knowledge, self-knowledge. We cannot ignore and accomplish the mysteries of death in ourselves psychologically. <clears throat> by saving those energies, by developing more conscious comprehension, by gathering together the energies from the impressions of life, we transform those forces. By saving the energies that are present in our psyche, we transform and accumulate those forces. We step towards immortality to conquer death. This is how we move from being the mere shadow of a human being into becoming a human being. Death, then, when we develop this conscious awareness of death, death is no longer a fearful thing. When you begin to recall and remember how many times you've already died, you begin to realize that death is not the problem. Ignorance is the problem. Life and death proceed as a cycle, which is natural. The essence proceeds from body to body, which is natural. There's nothing to be afraid of in that. What's to be fearful of or to be worried about is to ignore that. The longer we ignore it, the deeper our suffering becomes. When we conserve these forces, we begin to accomplish something that's written in the book of Corinthians in the Bible. Corinthians says, but some will say, how are the dead raised? And with what body do they return? 
Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not brought back to life, is not brought to life, except through death. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but grain. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. So is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. The possibility to acquire the celestial bodies, or in other words, what we would call immortality, is within our own corrupt body or physical body. The possibility to have resurrection lies within death. Death of desire. Death of that which is corrupt. The mind that we have is corrupt. The mind that we have is what's producing our pride, our anger, our gluttony, and our suffering. That mind has to die in order for something immortal perfect to be born. That rebirth is symbolized in many traditions, in many places. But in every case, the symbol is the same. We have to create the soul. The butterfly is a good example. That ugly caterpillar which is so grotesque, basically dies, in a sense. It, in, it places itself into a shell where it resides in weight, like a womb. And with time, with energy, the womb bursts and the butterfly emerges. But that shell remains behind. In a similar manner, we as soul have to abandon the shell. We would say in this case that the shell is related to the term klipot, which means the world of the shells. And the shells are our own egos, structures within our own psyche within which the soul, the essence, is trapped. When we, through the process of self-observation and meditation, transform the impressions of life, we do it with the purpose of extracting from those shells our own consciousness, which is a process of death. This is also symbolized in the famous story of Noah. Noah, of course, as you know, uh, his story is in the book of Genesis in the Bible. And Noah, the word Noah, is made by these characters Nun and He, which we'll be discussing in a later lecture. But Noah is a servant of the Lord. And when you look into the Bible, to the story of Noah, you see when he was 500 years old, the story begins to unfold about the great flood. We know from previous lectures that when you read about the ages of these initiates, this is symbolic. 500 years refers to that initiate having completed the fifth initiation of greater mysteries. And the fifth initiation of greater mysteries is related to the complete development of the bodies of the soul. 
These bodies are the solar astral body, the solar mental body, and the solar causal body. These are the three sons of Noah, his own soul. These sons are the butterfly itself. But Noah has to dissolve the shells. Those shells are the lunar ego, or the lunar astral body, the lunar mental body, and the lunar causal body. And these are symbolized by the evil population of the earth. Earth, in all of these stories, symbolizes our own physical body, our own earth, the microcosm, or man. And God, in order to destroy the evildoers, or our own egos, tells Noah, the consciousness, I'm going to send a flood to kill all those bad people. So if you want to be saved, you need to do something. You need to build an ark. We've pointed out in previous lectures that this term ark is related to arcanum or arcana. And of course, we're studying the 13th arcanum. But these 22 arcana all express the one great arcanum, which is this ark of Noah. The Ark of the Covenant, which is the same symbol. What's interesting about this story of Noah is that it's predated by other flood myths from every continent on this planet. There are at least 35 separate individual stories recorded of flood myths. They come from Australia, from Africa, from India, from China, from Iran, from the Native Americans, from South America, from the Nordics, from the Celtics. All of them have a flood myth, and all of them say essentially the same thing. To be saved from the waters, build an ark. In other words, a boat, a vessel, a vehicle, which will rise upon the waters What is that ark? When we look into the Bible, we see Jesus walking on the waters. This is an indication, a hint pointing towards the ark. We also hear Jesus discussing and describing the well of the waters of eternal life, or in other words, immortality. And that well, or that water, flows from our belly and gives eternal life, immortality. We also see in the Bible, Moses takes a staff and strikes a rock from which water flows, which gives life to the Israelites. But perhaps the most deeply psychological and interesting indication of the nature of the ark is found in Hinduism. The word immortality in the Hindu tradition is amrita. So to say immortality in Sanskrit, you would say amrita. And amrita is a liquid, a drink, an elixir. Or in other words, as the Greeks and Romans would call it, ambrosia. Amrita is a great ocean. And as you may know, this 13th arcanum is represented in the character Mem, which means water. 
So the great ocean, those profound waters which provide the sustenance which delivers immortality. The waters that come from the rock of Moses, the waters that Jesus walks upon, that fountain of water within our belly, which in Chinese alchemy they call the Tantian, the ocean of energy, which is in our belly, or near the belly. That ocean, in the Hindu tradition, the Hindu story, is the source of power for all the gods. Now the story goes that one day, Indra, one of the gods, was cursed by a sage. Now what's interesting to know about Indra is that Indra is the god of the weather, the god of rain, the god of the wind, the god of water. And he carries in his hand a thunderbolt like Zeus. That thunderbolt is called a Vajra. The curse that Indra is given is that the gods will lose their power. So the gods become worried. And Brahma, who is the father, Keter, who is a part of Indra, says, very well, then we need to churn the waters of the oceans in order to re retrieve the Amrita for us to persist in our immortality, to give ourselves the power that we need. But in order for them to do this, they have to churn the waters of the ocean. And the only way for them to do that is to vie, to fight, to struggle with the demons who also want the same power, who also want the power of immortality. And so between them, Indra takes a mountain and places it into the water as a giant pillar to use as a churning rod. So what do we have here? We have a vast ocean with a vertical phallic rod to be used to churn the waters. On one side of the waters are all the demons. In other words, our own psychological devils, our own ego. And on the other side of the waters are all the gods. In other words, the free portions of our consciousness, the being itself. And between them is a rod a mountain. This rod is obviously the Vajra, or thunderbolt, of Indra, which is the phallus, the masculine sexual potency. And the waters are the female sexual potency, the waters of the womb. So, the gods and the demons take a snake, a serpent, and they wrap it around the rod in the waters. And one group has the head, and one group has the tail, and they begin to struggle and pull back and forth, and the waters are churned. This is representative of something only the initiates will know. those who have been initiated and understand the nature of sexual alchemy. In other words, our own waters, our sexual waters, the waters of men, are churned by the conflict between our desires, the demons, and between the being, 
the needs of the consciousness. Our own being needs the waters of the oceans in order to remain immortal and to grow. But the demons also want the water to feed themselves and to overcome the gods. The secret of power is this intersection of the phallus with the waters, with the womb. Now, these waters, interestingly, can be related to another Hindu myth, which is a story of Prajapati. Prajapati is the ancient celestial father, the self-created one. Prajapati has his sexual forces, which form a lake. And the waters of that lake are called Madusham. And that word means not to be spoiled, not to be corrupted. Desire corrupts. So these celestial waters of our celestial father, Prajapati, should not be corrupted, must be remain pure. But the other name for these waters is Manusha, which means related to man. In the term Manusha is the term Manu, where we get the word man or human. So these waters, these celestial waters, which should not be spoiled with the corruption of desire, just as the Bible says, should not be corrupted with fornication and adultery. From these waters comes the mystery of the man. In other words, the solar man, the Manu. What has to occur is that we need to choose. Which side are we on? This is the Arcanum 6. We see in this, this visual image of the demons and the gods fighting over the waters using the serpent. This is the Arcanum 6. Indecision. The battle between the virgin and the whore. The battle between the needs of our own being and the needs of the ego. And what determines the victory or the defeat is our own individual will. That will is not expressed as intention. It is action. When we say will, we don't mean, I mean to do this and that. We mean, you do it. You either do it or you don't. You either are accomplishing the laws of your own being or you are not. That's the nature of karma. It is action. Those waters of men are where the sons of Noah come from, the solar bodies. Those waters flow from Prajapati, from our own Ain Sof. And that energy flows down the tree of life through Da'at. Da'at is here in the top of this card, the two flowers crossing. This is a symbol of the seal of Solomon, the star of David. The two triangles which represent Abba and Aima, the father and mother, Isis and Osiris. This union, from it flows the Shamayim, the fiery waters, the waters of men which are enlivened with the fires of Shin, the Holy Spirit. And those forces flow into us. Those waters are placed in Yasod. Those waters are the waters of Amrita, or immortality. When we look at our esoteric physiology, we, of course, start knowing that we have a physical body. But the physical body exists because we have an energetic body, which is within it. 
which is really one with it, but a superior part, which is called the vital body, the body of chi, the body of energy, or the etheric body. The etheric body is the body that manages all the energies that sustain our life. That body is actually made of four four layers or four levels. Four ethers or sheaths or channels which receive that solar energy. When we sleep, the physical body is resting. The etheric body is recharging and is healing the physical body. And many of our illnesses, such as cancer, actually are in the etheric body. They are sicknesses of the etheric body, which manifest then physically. Many illnesses like that that the doctors today can't fix because they don't recognize the, re the existence of the etheric body. Nonetheless, those forces, the waters which flow down from them, flow into our etheric body. But how do we use them? We exist, we are alive because of these waters which flow as a gift from God. But how do we use them? This is, an, again, more observation of ourselves, more knowledge of ourselves in order to understand. These four ethers, or four aspects of our own vital body, are symbolized in the Bible as the four rivers of Eden. Eden is a symbol of the fourth dimension of Yesod, the foundation which we fell from, we as Malkut. Malkut fell from Yesod. So Eden itself is divided into these four parts, these four rivers of life, four rivers of water. The first is called Pison. And we call this the ether of light. This is that part of our vital body which is related to memory and imagination. It's also related to Neshima, the breath of God, from which we can receive inspiration. So if we observe ourselves during the day, we need to be observing how are we using our imagination How are we using it? Because that imagination, the capacity to imagine, is given its force, its light, through this ether of light, which is fed by the waters of Mem. In other words, that outflowing of the Shamaim from our own Ein Sof. But how do we use our imagination? Are we fantasizing? Are we daydreaming? Are we imagining scenes of lust? Are we imagining scenes of revenge? Are we imagining our anger expressing itself and making others suffer? Is that how we are using the energies that God gives us? If so, we need to change. Because that produces karma. It produces suffering. Not only for those people that we imagine, because that thought, that imagination is real. When you imagine something, you're directing forces of energy. So that suffering that you're creating is not just for you. It's not just the karma of what will come, what you will sow from what you reap, what you will reap from what you sow. Those thoughts, that imagination, that fantasy affects other people. For example, you can make someone sick with your ill will, with your anger. You can make someone sick. Some illnesses are just that. 
the ill will of others. You can also feed someone's ego. If you have lust for a person and you imagine that person in a lustful way, you're feeding them your energy. What's worse is if you activate your own sexual energy and then imagine that person. You're giving them enormous quantities of negatively polarized energies, polarized with lust, which, incidentally, many people take advantage of. Many people encourage that. They want to be lusted for. They want to be wanted. And psychologically, they are stealing those energies from others. This is what we call a vampire. Vampires are real. They don't go around sucking people's blood. They suck people's energy by manipulating egos. So how are we using our own forces of imagination? How are we utilizing our own memory? Are we remembering desires? Are we fantasizing about what we want? The second river is called Gihon. This one we call the reflecting ether. And it's related to the memory and to the senses. The, the five senses that we have are really receiving reflections, vibrations. We're not seeing things as they really are. We're seeing energies reflected that are reflected. These images can be deceptive, can be illusory. We take them as real. But our perception is very limited. Interestingly, the five senses... In Sanskrit, let me find the actual name so I don't give you the wrong one. Are related to Indra. They are called Indriya. Remember I told you Indra is the god of the weather, rain, the waters, and he carries the thunderbolt. So the five senses are called indriya in Sanskrit, which indicate the power to perceive through the senses is a gift of the gods, but directly related to indriya, which is, of course, these waters of men. The spiritual aspirant has to learn to control those senses, to control the attention as it perceives through the senses. And in Sanskrit, this is called Indriya Samvara. Indriya Samvara is just the Sanskrit name for self-observation. It is the capacity to control the senses consciously. That is, to not fall into the trap of desire. To observe without attachment, without desire. So how are we using the waters which flow from God into our own reflecting ether? How are we receiving the impressions of life? How are we perceiving the world? Through the filter of our desires? Through the filter of our fears? Through the filter of our gluttony? Or are we seeing things purely clearly as they really are. The third ether is in the Bible called Hidikel, the river. We call this the chemical ether. The chemical ether is related to all the chemical processes of the vital body. In other words, nutrition, our metabolism, our digestion. And clearly, again, we see 
transformations of energy occurring with this ether. As we receive sustenance from life, the vital body transforms those forces in order to nourish ourselves. But again, we have to look at ourselves and analyze how are we transforming the energies of life, the energies that we need to be sustained. When we eat, when we eat our food, are we thinking of other things? Are we daydreaming? Are we desiring things? Or are we consciously consuming those elements? When we consciously eat with attention and gratitude, the foods that we ingest and the water and the air can be transformed into substance of a much higher voltage than the foods and water and air we consume when we're psychologically asleep. And there's an entire course about that, how that works, called the transformation of energy. The fourth ether in the Bible is called Euphrates, and this is the ether of life. And this is the way that our own vital body manages the sexual forces, the energies that we use to reproduce. And again, we must ask, how are we using these sacred waters which are placed within us by our own God? Are we using them to satisfy our desires, to satisfy our lusts? If so, we're producing karma. If so, we're delivering the potency of those waters to the demons. If we choose to follow the great arcanum to build the ark as Noah did, we can harness these forces of the ether of life and build the ark. Firstly, the ark is the creation of those solar bodies, the solar astral, solar mental, and solar causal bodies. But then, that vessel has to rise upon the waters. And what is contained in that mystery? The ark itself, the Bible gives measurements for this force, or the ark itself. In the Bible, God tells Noah, make the ark 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30. And of course, understanding the nature of Kabbalah, we know that these numbers are symbolic, not literal. The number 300 in the Hebrew alphabet, is the character Shin. Shin is the number of transmutation. The number, or the character, which contains the three forces of creation. And of course, we will talk in detail about this character in a later lecture. But in synthesis, we say it's fire. 50 of course, is related to the character Nun, which will be discussed in the next lecture. But Nun is related to temperance, the fish who inhabits the waters. And 30 is related to Lamed, which of course is the power of sacrifice. So the great arcanum, or in other words, white tantrism, is rooted in these three mysteries. And it's built within them. Knowing how to work with the, fodder, with the fires as a fish, utilizing the powers of sacrifice. In other words, to deny oneself and follow after the example of the great masters. To... To ride in the ark, 
means to rely upon the mysteries of transmutation, to dedicate oneself, to inhabit the science, to live the science. So the Lord tells Noah to go into the ark with his family, in other words, with his soul, and to take every kind of animal, in other words, his own mind. And the rains come. The rains come for 40 days. Now, mem also means 40. And 40 plays a significant role throughout the Bible. The 40 days of the rains, the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness, the 40 days that the Israelites were in the wilderness. So when we see 40, we need to remember mem. 40 indicates a period of time, a passage to exist, to be in the wilderness, to be in the ark. In other words, to die as an ego, to be tested. And here Noah faces this. The waters rise. Noah enters the ark. The rain falls for 40 days. And you see that Noah is there with Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who are his solar bodies. The waters cover everything, and it says in the Bible, to a depth of 20 feet. And all the creatures of the earth are killed, except for Noah and his family. 20 course, the Arcanum 20, which we'll discuss later, that it's the number of resurrection. And as you know from Corinthians, there can be no resurrection without death. All of these creatures in the mind of the initiate have to die. All of our anger, all of our envy, all of our fear, all of our pride, all of our lust, these elements have to be completely dead before the soul can resurrect and become perfected. When we create the vessel of the ark, in other words, when we create the soul, we become a man, manu. In other words, a human being. As we are, we are just a phantom or a sketch of a human being, subject to the cycles of birth and death, tossed about by karma no consciousness of anything. By developing the soul, we become man, in other words, manas, manu, a human being. But then we have to become a superhuman, in other words, a resurrected master, a Christified master, like Moses, like Noah. For that to occur, all of those unclean humanities, which are our own mind, have to die, all the discursive desires we have. And once they're dead, resurrection can occur. In other words, the waters reach 20 feet, the number 20, resurrection. When that death occurs, the resurrection comes, then the soul is born as a resurrected master, as a perfected creature. The ability to command the waters is an effort of will. And will is symbolized by a sword, by a rod. The rod, of course, here is this rod of Indra, the rod of the Vajra, the thunderbolt of Zeus, the trident of Poseidon, who commands the waters. All of these gods are really just symbols of parts of our own being. This is something else we need to grasp. All of these stories and mythologies are for us, about us, about what we need as a soul. Interestingly, if you look at the symbol of the Vajra, the thunderbolt, 
that Indra, or that Zeus, wields. We see in the Tibetan tradition that the Vajra takes on additional meaning. The Vajra, in this Tibetan Buddhist tradition, is also called the diamond, or adamantine, that which is indestructible. And truly, this is the will of God. The will of God is indestructible, is immortal. But we have to become one with that will in order to acquire the power over death, to become immortal. We have to embody that will, to be that will in our every action, in thought, in feeling, and in deed. In the Tibetan tradition, the highest form of tantrism in the Tibetan tradition is called Vajrayana, which means the way of the diamond, or the diamond path. And in those schools, you see often the lamas, the priests, wielding a vajra in one hand and a bell in the other. The vajra is shaped like, in some way, similar to the symbol of infinity. And that symbol represents emptiness or shunyata. And this is important. It's with the comprehension of impermanence and the void nature of all things that we develop detachment and equanimity. So that vajra, which represents will, also represents the comprehension of emptiness, which is right view. And with that point of view, the will of God emptiness as one thing. We then have the capacity to harness those waters. But where are they? And the other symbol held in hand by the tantric Buddhists, we see a bell. A bell which is shaped like a cup, like a grail. Observe the Dalai Lama with a vajra and a bell in his hands. The vajra is the masculine sexual force. The bell is the feminine sexual force. In other words, the path of skillful means. Wisdom and skillful means combined. But what's interesting is when we combine these two symbols of the bell and the vajra, if you draw an upturned U, like the, the shape of the bell, and you draw in the center of it the rod, you have the symbol of Neptune, the trident, which is the same symbol as Shin, the Hebrew character. Shin is fire. Neptune rules the waters, the fiery waters of Shamayim which are those waters flowing from the Mem into our own organism as those four ethers of the vital body. The goal of the initiate is to ride in the ark as an act of will, equilibrating the Vajra and the bell, controlling the waters, as Jesus walks upon them and being able to sustain the equilibrium as those waters rise and destroy everything. Pay close attention to that. The waters destroy everything. The waters are the bringers of life and the bringers of death. Consider that very carefully. If you as a physical body could not have water, you would die. Quickly and painfully. But the same applies to your soul. The soul itself requires water to be sustained 
And this is why the gods and the demons are battling over the ocean of Amrita. Because the soul, to sustain itself, to have power, to have life, must have water. But the waters of the Shamayim, the waters of the being, which are the Manusha, the waters that should not be spoiled, purified water, transmuted water. The method to purify our own dirty waters is taught by the Master Jesus in his first miracle. The first miracle that Jesus performs is at a wedding. A wedding is a marriage between man and wife. And at this wedding, he transforms water into wine. The wine of the Spirit. The wine of the Eucharist. The wine which nourishes the development of the soul. In the same manner, when the gods win over the demons in the story of Indra and the lake of Amrita, we see that from these waters arise Sura, the goddess of wine. Kastuba, the most valuable jewel in the world. Kalpavriksha, the wish-fulfilling tree. Kamadenu, the first cow. Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth and fortune. From the waters arise the Divine Mother, Ma. From the waters rise the tree of life. In the Bible, we know that the tree rises by the rivers of water. Remember that? I think it's in Proverbs or Psalms. Psalms. The beautiful poet who's saying to be like a tree flourishing by the rivers of water. That is the tree of life. The tree of life is rooted in yasod, in our own sexual waters, and grows upon our spinal column, the rod grasped by the angel of death. And that tree grants wishes in accordance with God's will. That tree grows in the womb of the Divine Mother, who is the goddess of wealth and fortune, who is the goddess of wine, who is Ma. Interesting that in Sanskrit, the mother is Ama. And in Hebrew, Aima. The mother. And also interesting that in Sanskrit, the god of death is Yama. The god of death who grasps in his claws the wheel of life. The God of death who's among the oldest of all the known divinities in humanity. The God of death who can free us from suffering if we abide by the rules of Dharma, which is, incidentally, his other name. The god of death is called Dharma. That's his name. Dharma means law, truth. This teaching is Dharma. It is the law. It is truth. Any true teaching is Dharma. Any pure action is Dharma. Any wrong action is Adharma, without Dharma. The name Yama also means to do. So when you enter into any school of yoga in the ancient traditions, the first thing you learn, yama and niyama, to do and not to do. And you're given 
vows. Do these things and don't do these things. By doing so, you enter into the path of dharma, right action, the path of death, death of the ego. These traditional yamas or steps are ahimsa, which is nonviolence. Are we living with that guide? Are we acting in a nonviolent way in our thoughts, in our feelings, in our actions? If we have violent thinking, anger, resentment, skepticism, fanaticism, which are all anger, which are all violent, we are performing niyama, wrong action. Number two, satya, truthfulness. To tell the truth in word and thought. Are we truthful? Are we truthful with ourselves? Are we lying to ourselves? Are we deceiving ourselves? Number three, asteya. To not enter into debt. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about karma. To not create karmic debt. To not covet. To not steal. To not owe. Number four, brahmacharya. To have purity in our sexual energies. To be faithful. Truly, brahmacharya means to be faithful. Someone who's married can be in brahmacharya, being faithful to their spouse. Number five, kshama. To be patient, to be in the now, to be in non-attachment. The sixth yama, driti. To be steadfast, to be without fear. To be decisive. Interesting that that is the sixth yama. To be decisive. Of course, we know the sixth arcanum is indecision. So the sixth yama is saying, decide, choose your path and follow it. But in every moment. The seventh is daya, compassion. Everyone thinks they are compassionate. But what is compassion? Compassion is conscious love. Conscious. Sometimes conscious love looks like anger, looks like pain. The parent who disciplines the child does so with conscious love. The child doesn't like it. Same thing with God. In his love for us, God gives us death. God gives us our karma. God gives us suffering. Yama, the god of death, is a god of compassion. He is a dharmapala, a protector of the dharma, a dharma king. The eighth are java, honesty, straightforwardness, renouncing deception, renouncing wrongdoing. The ninth Mitahara, moderate behavior, no gluttony. The tenth, Shaucha, purity, chastity. These ten yamas are ten rules that the god of death in the ancient Hindu mythologies demands. He demands them as a god of dharma, as an embodiment of dharma or truth. And these ten yamas relate very closely to the Ten Commandments, as you see. In order for us to apply the mysteries of the Mem, the 13th Arcanum, we have to go into the waters of ourselves. 
And in order to do so, we have to understand the 14th arcanum, which is coming in the next lecture. Any other questions? A near-death experience is exactly that. It is the experience of the consciousness as it brushes against its own mortality. And generally those experiences are karmic. They oftentimes can be a gift, let's say from the being, who says, hey, stupid, Death is just around the corner. You need to wake up. Most people don't take advantage of that. But a near-death experience is true. The trick is, the difficulty is, to interpret that experience. The problem is this. Our mind is a liar. The consciousness that we have is trapped within a whole host of subjective elements. What we perceive is filtered through those elements. So even in the context of, let's say you get out of the body, you have an out-of-body experience, you have a powerful dream, or you have a near-death experience, what you see may be a projection of your own mind. And this is evidenced by fighting groups who've had near-death experiences whose experiences contradict. Some people see Jesus, some people see Buddha, some people see Krishna. All those experiences are equally valid and equally invalid. Because of the subjective nature of the mind and the lack of the consciousness's ability to discriminate. So, if someone has had a near-death experience, they should take advantage of that. Utilize that as a stimulant for their own conscious growth. The problem comes when we become attached to those experiences, identified with those experiences, and we take them at their literal value, which is not really worth much. So you have to be a little careful when you're looking at near-death documentation. Do you have a question? Absolutely. Every moment of life is a moment of death. And the death is occurring according to our will. You're exactly right. What's really interesting there is that if you observe just the process of the body, our body is dying right now. Throughout your body are cells which are dying, organs which are dying, all the elements. There's the process of life and death occurring every moment. And there's a great scale that determines the health of your body. And truth is a very wise statement that says, a state of health is just the slowest progress towards death. It's true. Being healthy means you're just going a little slower towards what's inevitable. But death is happening in every moment. Where will comes into play is how you use your energy. The energies that descend into you from God combined with the energies that arrive into you by impressions. Impressions of life. Those impressions may be physical or otherwise, but they are impressions and they have to be transformed. The application of our own vajra, that expression of will, is what determines what is dying and what is being born. If we remain identified with pride, with anger, with fear, with fanaticism, with any kind of attachment, we're killing our soul. We ourselves have put ourselves in our situation. There's no one to blame for our suffering but ourselves. And if you're blaming someone else, 
It's because you haven't comprehended how you yourself produced that karma. You may blame your spouse, but what you're having as suffering is just coming back to you from what you have done previously. And that's why the Bible says, God is not mocked. Everyone will reap what they sow. And Jesus said, every iota of the law will be fulfilled. So, the answer is, we have to align our will with the will of the law, the law of karma, the law of dharma. And in doing so, we develop the capacity to die psychologically from moment to moment, but to be born spiritually. Beautiful, isn't it? It's, it's all in will, but it's conscious will, not intellectual, not emotional. It doesn't mean that you just feel like it's a good idea, and you say, yeah, I agree with that. That's good, but that accomplishes nothing. You have to do it. You have to live it, moment to moment, being attentive, being aware, utilizing your energies in the right way, learning what that means in yourself. There's no easy answer. Yes? So are you saying that you have to dive to the physical body and how our nature is, you know, in the living world, but in the um, immortal world, like when Jesus died and gave himself completely to his Father, that's, that's the way that you live forever. That's exactly right. The question is, we die to everything physical, to everything material. And Jesus repeated that many times. So that's why we shouldn't be afraid. Should, there's no reason for fear. Exactly. When you really understand death, there's nothing to be afraid of. Death is natural. What's to be afraid of is our own mind. Because it's our own mind that produces suffering and that keeps us trapped in ignorance. That's what you need to worry about, is how you deceive yourself. Because of karma. We were born in this state because of previous action. If you observe your own life, you can see that. Observe in your own life how life becomes more complicated. Life becomes more burdened. Little by little. As you act, as you react, as you do things, more complication, more pain, more suffering. Because of ignorance. Ignorance. Because we ourselves don't know how to act in accordance with dharma, with the law. And this is why the old Greek masters have stated, place your heavens, place your treasures in heaven. Because anything material will dissolve, will pass away, will rot. That in heaven means your own psychological heaven, your own being. Meaning put your faith in God. Put your values in the values of the spirit. Don't be attached to anything physical. People, places, houses, money, cars, degrees, education, anything. Any given situation, any circumstance, we have to renounce. To be prepared to be poor or rich and be the same person, either way. To be loved or hated and be the same person. That's a process of death. But it's also a process of birth. Because we're putting the values of every moment into the consciousness, not into attachment, not into desire. That's growth. That is a growth, most definitely. But it's difficult. It takes a lot of effort. So the problem is not money, but the attachment to money. Precisely. The problem is not in things. The problem does not lie in whether you have money or you don't. The problem doesn't lie whether you're educated or uneducated. The problem always is in the mind. Attachment. Desire. Craving. Aversion. This is the problem. You can be an initiate with very high development and advancing and be a pauper and be happy. You can also be rich and be happy. It's irrelevant. The circumstances are irrelevant. They're only relevant to the mind. 
It's desire which wants to be a certain way, to be perceived a certain way, to have certain things. The being is the being. The being is and is amongst all things. So in the process of death, your being will present all of these things to you in order to see how you react. And that's part of the meaning of the waters rising. When God tests Noah, when he says to Noah, the waters will come, be prepared. This is related to a certain process of initiation in which the being brings everything. And the initiate has to be prepared for that. We have to be prepared to die to all things, to be presented with the riches of the earth and to be indifferent, to be presented with the possibility of poverty and starvation and to be indifferent, to have contentment and serenity in the face of any circumstance, in the face of any impression, to be the same one. Any soul can accomplish that. But so long as the soul is listening to the voice of desire, the soul will fail. What has to die to accomplish the 13th Arcanum is desire. In its entirety, its very shadow has to die. And we're going to get into that a little bit more over the next few lectures, what that means. It's very demanding. But always bear in mind God is with us. Your own being is with you. Remember that in the Bible it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are always with me. Never forget that. As dire as life becomes, or as good, as beautiful or as painful, as much success you have or as much failure as you have, be indifferent. Be the same and remember your God. And if you can accomplish that, you will fulfill the mysteries of the 13th Arcanum. Any other questions? Good. See you next week. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, Lord,